Hello everyone and uh, welcome to another episode of where we'll be learning Q today uh, with again my very good friend uh, David aka Raw Code. Uh, so uh, if you are new to the channel uh, please consider subscribing it so that you do not miss any of the streams uh, that are coming up and which will be lined up obviously for the next uh, few months as well and uh, uh, so it takes time to do all that, uh, you know, uh, all the planning and execution. So uh, the only thing that you can do for support is just subscribe that and share that so that maximum people can get benefit from it. And uh, please try to make the uh, session interactive as much as possible. Uh, so very excited for uh, today's session uh, because today we'll be learning all about Q. Q is an open source language. Uh, and it is basically uh, what you call uh, configure, unify, execute. Uh, so it's becoming more and more popular. And you might have seen a very good implementation uh, with um, of uh, in the form of Dagger, if you have heard of it uh, at DockerCon, where Solomon Hikes, who created uh, Docker, uh, due to which we all are earning today. Uh, so we have now Dagger in place, which is in works and which is uh, based on QLang. Uh, and uh, David himself has, uh, you know, worked uh, with QLang and uh, created uh, some of the uh, tooling as well. Uh, so he's a, a fan of languages and he keeps on exploring them and creating some of the other tools uh, based on uh, the needs, obviously. So, uh, so uh, all languages, obviously, when they are created, they are created with a purpose. And if we get that purpose right, uh, so we can find a specific problem that uh, we are facing and we try to solve and fit that particular language for that particular problem and that's where we have the microservices architecture uh, where you have the choice of writing uh, your microservices in your languages uh, not only that plus uh, you write the uh, you solve the specific problem in a particular microservices using a language which, which actually uh, serves that better so that's that's the concept uh, that is there. So every time a new language, we, we learned Rust. So we actually scratched the surface of Rust uh, last time, which was good uh, because uh, again, that has its own unique power. Uh, but again, it does not solve all the use cases that are there in the industry. So that's why people keep on innovating. That's why the cloud native ecosystem keeps on innovating. And that's where we have QLang now and people are you know, building on QLang and it's it has a great, uh, great uh, future. Uh, people have been talking about that all over the place. So I think that would be interesting uh, to learn. And uh, today we'll be learning uh, most of, uh, I'm not, not most of it, but yeah, today we'll be learning about uh, QLang because in, no programming can be learned in one hour. Just get that straight. Uh, so David, uh, again, please uh, introduce yourself a bit. I know who are watching the stream definitely know David, uh, but yeah, it, it's better like, you know, uh, you can do some promotion. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Sam. So as Sam said, my name is, is David, uh, David McKay. Um, you can find me on Twitter. In fact, you can find me everywhere as Raw Code. Uh, today's session will be good. Um, unlike Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday's session where we, we had a one hour intro to Rust. Rust is a vast programming language with a lot of different and scary, unique features. The surface of Q is much smaller and I think we'll actually do a pretty good job of getting through a, a large chunk of Q and its usage today. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited. I think, I think we can really sell Q today. Um, it's one of my favorite data templating configuration languages that has built in constraints. Uh, as Siam said, it stands for configure, unify, and execute. And we'll take a look at each of those steps of what Q brings to the table. If things go my way, which is rare on a live stream, um, we'll try and do something cool with, with Kubernetes and, and look at how you can actually apply Q in a, a cloud native context. And I really liked what Siam said about microservices and having this ability now to select the right tools for the jobs and Q fits a few of those different um, patterns. So it's going to be fun. Yep. Uh, and also just to add, uh, so if, if you check out David's channel, uh, so it's it's Raw Codes Academy, uh, make sure you subscribe to that. Tons of amazing material that my friend has put up in the past year. And uh, we'll keep on doing that. Obviously, we are not stopping. We both are not stopping at any cost. Uh, so there is a very, very uh, unique series which um, uh, Raw Code is doing, apart from all the live streaming and the Academy stuff, which is called Clustered. Uh, now, Clustered is very unique where uh, you know, people, uh, one of the folks from the cloud native industry, they break the cluster and the other one fix that. 
and yesterday was the first episode where uh, it was team edition so like uh, there was a co team which was uh, our team i was there as well and there was container solutions team so the teams broke the cluster and fixed the cluster uh, live so it was a two hour uh, full packed session <laughs> and i really enjoyed that and glad that both of the clusters were fixed uh, in time so very fun session if you haven't watched that uh, do watch the yesterday's uh, clustered episode and make sure to subscribe so that you know you are uh, you get all the notifications for the future episode because uh, cluster is really good if you are learning cka if you are learning how to troubleshoot kubernetes because people uh, like what we did we actually broke all the things that uh, the customers break or we see them in in you know uh, the real world life so uh, like that in the mindset uh, all of them break the clusters and uh, you will be getting you know a good solid knowledge if you see all the episodes till now uh, david uh, has become a master of you know fixing the clusters uh, actually uh, by now so if you also watch all the series you will actually learn a lot a lot of new techniques of debugging as well you've done a better job of promoting me than i did of myself so thank you for that but uh, <laughs> You're right. Clustered has been the, the most invaluable Kubernetes uh, from an operational point of view, learning experience for me all year. Like we are 16, 17 episodes into it now. We've witnessed over 36 broken clusters and just seeing the ways that people demolish them, break them and fix them back up. You're just, there's just so much learning there. Like it definitely I encourage people to check it out. So thank yep. you. <laughs> so let's get started with Q. No. All right. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen with you first. So I'm going to do a shameless plug first, if that's all right. Yep. So this is, is, is not Q, but Q adjacent. Uh, I, along with my friend, Brian Kettleson, uh, you may be familiar with him from the Go yep. community, Microsoft developer advocate. And we just had this idea that we wanted all of our data to live and get and be able to publish it and consume it over a GraphQL API. One of the tools we've been using for this over the last six months, a year, I can't really remember now, is Q. But we try to add uh, some tooling on top of it to make it easier for other people that aren't as familiar with Q to still leverage Q for data validation um, and a few other really cool things. So I would recommend people check out qblocks.com. There's the spelling of qblocks here. Um, basically, you give it YAML or JSON or Markdown with front matter, it will validate it for you and then expose it over GraphQL or REST. And that's all I will say about that. But uh, <laughs> it's a cool tool. Um, okay. Today, I am going to, as best as I can, guide you through the primitives of Q. And that just means working with the CLI, writing Q constraints. Uh, and maybe doing a little bit of juggling between formats. I'm also going to introduce you to two websites today. So this is the qlang.org, which is the official Q website. It has documentation. It has tutorials on it. These are all very, very good. There is also qtutorials.com, which has more tutorials on it. And depending on the way that you learn, whether you like to do a lot of reading or you like to do a lot of code reading like so versus pros versus hands-on tutorials is more hands-on and that you can jump straight in and start copying code and see it in action whereas qlang goes into a lot more of the understanding and the you know the mathematics behind how the q matrix works so two invaluable resources everybody should check both of them out and a wise man would start with one of these but i am not a wise man i'm going straight to my terminal so First thing I want to show you is that Q is a superset of JSON. All that means is we can put JSON in. So I can write, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> I can be 21, right? Okay, so this is a, a JSON document. You can see here, I've got my open parentheses. I've got two keys, the name and age with two values. And we can do a Q eval main.json and we get a Q document back. This also works for YAML. So I'm gonna do a name, David, age 22 this time. And we get a Q document back. And this is one of the 
the, my favorite things about Q is that you can take existing configuration and data structures. Oh, Solomon's in the chat. Hey, Solomon. Uh, and use the Q tooling to play around with it. And I, I just think that's really, really cool. But we're not here to learn JSON or YAML today. I want to give you a nice, gentle introduction to Q. And I think the best way to do that is to take some of these simple data structures and start to apply constraints to it. Because validating Q like this is probably one of the first use cases that you're going to have for the language. And really, it's after you've started applying constraints that understanding the flexibility of Q and applying that for templating and generating the actual YAML and JSON, that's when that all comes in, plowing in behind it. That sound good? Just making sure you're still paying attention, Sion, that's all. Yep. <laughs> all right, so let's create our first Q file. And we will start with the exact same thing we did already. So you'll see Q kind of looks like YAML. Um, we can just type key value pairs. Uh, oh, I've forgotten how to quit them. Uh, we can eval main.q, and I'm going to hate that I call all my files main now because I'm going to have to type out the extension. But it just evaluates the way that we want. So if we wanted to apply a policy or constraints to this document, we can understand how Q handles unification. And I'm not going to go into this from a mathematical point of view. One, because it would take a lot of time, and two, because I would get it all wrong. But we can say here that we expect properties called name to be a string and our age to be an int. And if we run this again, you'll see that the constraints or the schema that we applied to our Q document are evaluated out. And this is just something that Q eval does as part of its, um, well, that's what the tool does. <laughs> I don't even know how best to describe that, but yeah, that's expected behavior. Um, is that we don't need the schema back out, right? Q evaluates it and it spits out the, the result object that we expect. So why don't we change the type of the age to no longer be an integer, but to be a float? And now when we run the Q eval, we actually get told, hey, the constraints that you applied on these properties is no longer valid. Uh, so let's do a few more things. And I'm going to jump back to the documentation and we'll cover some of the types that are available and the way that constraints work in a bit more detail. And I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor for it just now first. Okay. Something else we can do is, is it may seem a little weird what's happening here, right? Because we've defined the name property twice and the age property twice. What Q does is overlays all of the values on top of each other. It calls this unification. And as long as no constraints are broken during the unification, you get out a single data structure. But you don't have to write it this way either. In fact, it's probably more idiomatic to say that name is a property. And then we can use ampersands and pipe symbols to be and and or like we do in code. And here what we're saying is, well, we expect this to be a string and a default value of David. And this would be a default value of 21. We evaluate this again, and things just work. OK. Now, the queue, uh, the queue is going to throw various random words at you through the lifetime of it. And the best thing to do there is to consult the documentation. So I'm going to try and get it to error out uh, I think they call that disjunction in Q, which sounds very scary. But let's assume uh, Andrew is my middle name that you're now all learning. And we'll add on Siam. So now we have a disjunction on name, which just says that the value of name has to be one of those values, which means if we try and set this to pop, a pop, I'm sure you're not here, but I'm going to use you anyway. Then you can see here we get three errors and an empty disjunction. It's expecting one of these other values. So Q is really, really powerful. 
And you just have to understand the way these constraints work. Sometimes you will have to learn the vocabulary like disjunction. But once you get all these primitives underway, you just have this really superpower available for all your future configuration and templating needs. Now, before we jump back to the documentation and try to cover some of the types and the other language features, is that all making sense? And does anyone have any questions? Yep, and I don't think any questions so far. Awesome, okay. Okay, so let's see, this is the tutorials website. This is the one that I sent people to first before qline.org just because I think the examples with the syntax highlighting and a few other bits and pieces are really are a bit more visual for the learning situation. So what you can see here is that we can have lists in Q. That's not really big enough, is it? There we go. Uh, we have floats as we've uh, kind of already seen. Uh, we have objects. And we have, this is a, a reference to another field. So we're going to play around with that a little bit as well. There's then lots of documentations on how the lattice works. Uh, that's the mathematical stuff where you have to understand constraint theory, type theory, a whole bunch of other stuff. Way beyond my pay grade, I have no idea. What we see here, and I love to show just these three things in combination, really is at the core of Q is what you want to kind of take away from today's session, is that Q allows us to define a schema. So you see title is a string, we've got years, we've got booleans. We can then apply constraints on top of this, saying that the year must be greater than this value. And we can apply the data which will be validated. And all three of these live side by side in the one file or multiple files, but they're all unified together and you get a data structure out. And um, we have a few questions as well. Of course, yes, love questions. So uh, is Q just for configuration validation? Uh, no, validation, I think, is just one of the first steps that people take when adopting Q. You know, typically we already have, uh, I'm going to, to speak from a Kubernetes context here, right? We all have enough YAML and we need to be able to validate that YAML, apply policy to that YAML. And Q is really just, it comes in there quite nicely. Then you can start to look at the other features of Q, which, be, which are the ability to generate template and build commands with this constraints and data at the same time. How about nested key value? Yeah, good question. Let's jump back over to the terminal. So there's, I've only used flat data structures so far. So, you know, that's a, a really good question. But let's assume we were going to model a Kubernetes deployment. Well, we could have Kubernetes. Uh, we could say, let's see if I can remember this, API version, apps v1, kind, deployment, we'd have spec, template, I'm not actually going to try and do this off the top of my head because it's a waste of time, but containers, and then I'll just do image nginx, this is all valid queue, um, you can nest this stuff like so. And what happens here is I can do a QE val on this and we get pretty much the same data structure out just because we didn't really do anything unique here. Um, and just because I started on a Kubernetes example, let's tackle one of the biggest complaints I have about Kubernetes YAML, which is duplication. So, you know, let's see, we've got metadata, which has labels. Uh -huh, name. David, uh, and then I want to reapply these labels down here. Then I can do Kubernetes metadata. And you'll see my labels replicated. So Q is extremely powerful and you only need to know a few tricks to take advantage of that. This is just a reference to another value within the Q document. There are other things I can do here. So I'm, I'm kind of segueing away, so I'll, I'll step back a second. Hopefully I answered the question about nested values and I'll carry on with this if there are no more questions. There is uh, one, which is, can you use to validate JSON files and can you specify constraint in a different file and then use it to validate other data source files? Oh yeah, that's... Yeah, that's a perfect, perfect scenario for Q. And I'll show you that right now. And hey, Borco, nice to see you. Okay, so let's 
actually use some of these other files. So I'm going to I'm going to modify main.yaml. Uh, no, actually, you know what? That's name David age twenty two and main.json. We have name. Let's just change the name in this so we got so I am and twenty one. And then we're going to use our main.q as constraints for both of those different disparate content types. So I will delete all of my Kubernetes stuff for now. We can always come back to it. So we have here constraints that say name must be David, Andrew, or Siam, and the age must be an integer. So we can actually do a qvet, and we can use our main.q, main.json, and main.yaml. And that worked. Right, because everything in our main.q and our data files pass the constraints. So let's modify the constraints. Siam, so I'm cutting you out. I'm also going to change the default value on this and say that the age must be older than 21. And now if we revet our documents, we have error messages. So this is validating both the JSON and the YAML against our Q constraints. We can see here that Siam is not a valid name. So we can fix that. What file were you in, Siam? Were you JSON? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Andrew is valid. Uh, and I don't know why I messed up my, hold on, main.q. Oh yeah, because I did an R here, sorry. So I was saying it could be any integer or greater than 21. Actually, we want any integer and larger than 21. Now we've got another error saying our integer is out of bounds. It has to be bigger than this. So we're going to bump Andrew's age up to 23 and we can vet that document as too. So Q really doesn't mind if you're working with YAML or JSON. You specify your constraints in Q itself and you can start throwing that around all the files that you want right off the bat. So I hope that answered your question, Barco. Is there anything else? No? Nope. Okay. I think so far interesting. <laughs> okay. So let's jump over here. Uh, yeah. Duh, duh, duh. I think we already covered defining fields. Definitions. Okay. So definitions are where things get really cool as well with Q. Um, we can use this uh, hash symbol, pound symbol, whatever you call it in your local dialect, to define, uh, essentially, think of them like objects, structs, types, depending on what your background is, where we can say that the data that we have must conform to these set of properties. And um, you can see here that what we're saying is that we have this concept, this type called an album, and for something to qualify as an album, it must have an artist, a title, and a year. Then we can actually say, well, we have this, and just you can ignore the type of the ampersand now, but if you just imagine that we have this structure, you know, this artist, title, and year, then what we can say is, and we expect it to conform to this type, and then we can validate and evaluate that at the exact same time. And this is one of the things that Kubeblocks, the project that Brian and I are working on, tries to make easier for people, is that we provide the tooling that loads all of your type from disparate directories, allocates a type to it, and does the validation out of the other side. And um, depending on how things go, we may take a look at that towards the end. But um, this definition and type flexibility in Q is a, a very cool thing as well. Okay, so then we've got uh, conjunctions which is, you know, just the ability to multiply, uh, just the ability to unify and to have these constraints all apply on top of each other. You can see here that we're saying int and greater than zero and less than 100. These are our constraints. And then we have our value. These would be unified and evaluated together. Disjunctions we kind of already covered, but that's just the ability to say that we accept one of many values or one of multiple values and being able to apply that constraint too. Uh, I mean, hopefully you aren't doing string or integer, but in Kubernetes land, that's maybe not that unfamiliar. So, you know, all of these things are available. And again, you don't need to invest too much time. You really just need to get to grips with the, the primitives of Q, which is just applying these constraints and types. Okay, defaults we covered, so we're not going to waste any time on that. 
Um, yes, we have this we have this thing called open and closed in queue, which is one of the one of the things that I see a lot of people trip themselves up on, is that types by default are closed, which means we cannot add any new values to it. Um, let's see if we can actually show that here. If I'm going too fast, you can all tell me to slow down. <laughs> but let's define a type here, which will be uh, a profile. And what we're going to say is with a profile, we have a name, which is a string. We have handles. And we have supported handles, which are GitHub and Twitter. Uh, you can imagine if you were going to model your live streams, I am as a series of YAML files in a GitHub repository. You may want this as a type to apply to your guests. Like when you push that, you want something to validate that you have all the right stuff that you need for your guests. So now we can say that, well, we have profiles, which is going to be a list of profile. And then we can start to apply our data on top of this. Uh, so we can say uh, name David handles. I'm going to get the syntax wrong, aren't I? Let's see. Uh, and I'm going to remove this stuff at the top. Okay, so now what we have in this queue is a type definition of a profile. We're saying a profile can have something called a name, it can have something called handles, of which we accept two more properties, GitHub and Twitter. Here, first thing I'm doing is just saying that we're going to have a key called profiles, which can be a list of profiles. The dots you may or not be familiar with from JavaScript. Um, I think, I can't remember what other languages use it. There's a few now. If I were to omit the three dots, we'd be saying that this list should only have one uh, one value. I could also do two values and three values, but that's going to get rather verbose and, well, crap. So uh, we can use the spread operator just to say we don't know how many, but we're going to accept multiple profiles here. Um, then here we apply our data to this where we say, okay, we have a list and we have one value. And we've not specified a type here, but this constraint will make, this constraint should enforce it to validate it. I'm saying that with a lot of doubt, but I'm hoping so. Oh, uh, I forgot the hash symbol. Okay, it worked. So let's change that. Let's add my age. And run this again. Now we get the field age is not allowed. This is what we call a closed definition. And it's just because definitions by default in queue are closed. As the documentation was saying, we could add this to open it up and that would work. So open and closed is just one of those things that it's up to you as the, the person applying the constraints to apply them at the granularity or strictness that you expect. And I might just say, you know what, I don't want any extra data in this definition. So it's going to fail validation if it is included and we can take this out and we evaluate it again. As part of the evaluation, we are seeing that we're getting the, the schema back in our eval. Something we can do with Q is it has this concept of concreteness. Whereas if I run this again, we will no longer get the definition. And I'm throwing a lot at you here, so I hope you're all keeping up. But concreteness just means that we actually want to finalize all of our data, remove the schema, and give us the final artifact, which is what we got here. Phew, that was a lot in a few minutes. <laughs> yep, and I think that's the flow is looking superb and people are learning. A uh, couple of questions, though. Um, can we validate uh, the length of list? Uh, I'm going to try and guess what that question is saying. So um, let's use another example. I, the answer is yes. Um, it just depends on the way that you need to do it and where you want to define that control. But if we assume that uh, we have a list of uh, int, 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 and I do list here, one, two, three, four. 
this will fail or validation um, because we already uh, had a, we added a constraint that said this should only have three integers so yes you can validate the the length there's also um there's also functions in q oh and if i remember in the syntax it's going to be painful for me uh but you can do a uh, length is it uh i don't remember let's see We'll find it. We can always find it in the standard library. I can't remember exactly. But um, there are functions on properties. In fact, I think I'm just being really silly. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, it's a function where we can pass in um, parts of our data to it to get values back out here. So there's an entire standard library on Q. And len is just one of hundreds of functions available to us. We have... I'll throw some things at you just now. We can look at them. We've still got loads of time, but there's conditionals, there's list comprehensions, there's uh, Kubernetes modules, there's JSON modules, there's YAML modules. I can decode YAML and spit out JSON and Mar uh, like there's there's so much so much stuff. <laughs> I'm getting excited thinking about all the stuff we can do today. But uh, there's one more from Carlos. Like, uh, would this be helpful in CI/CD pipeline to validate values dot YAML for Helm just to deploy per environment? Oh, hell yeah, definitely. So I think that's like one of those things where it's step one, Carlos. Like, yeah, you, you can use Q to validate or apply a schema to your Helm values file. I think once you've done that and you're like, oh, this is really cool, is that you'll start going, all right, do I need Helm? Like, why am I using Go templates and YAML files in Helm when I can provide abstractions in Q and provide really simple interfaces to generate that Helm chart myself? Um, and I think that's the journey that most people from the Kubernetes space will probably take with Q, is simple validation tasks, start to realize there's a lot more power there, and then use Q for the templating itself. Interesting. And uh, what about if you say list between and no more than five? Oof. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, whether I can pull it off the top of my head. So uh, we want a list with zero to five values. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's try. So we could say, um, I think there are ranges, right? I think you can maybe do something like this, but I can't remember off the top of my head. So what I'm going to do is say a list of any size. And we have a constraint where the len of list must be less than five. Um, so let's try breaking that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh no, because that is value to boolean expression. Dreads. And um, there will be, Carlos. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Solomon in the chat, if you're still there, feel free to drop it in. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll come across it in the documentation over the next 20 minutes. Yep. I think that's... Is that it? That's okay. <laughs> All right. Fun. Good questions. Really good questions. Uh, and the answer here is not no to any of the stuff that I don't know off the top of my head. It just means I probably haven't tried to do it before in Q. Uh, and I, I mean, I still use the documentation all the time and I've been using Q for about 18 months now. So, you know, there, the standard library is vast. There's things there. There'll be ways to do it. Okay, so we covered open and closed. And um, we've already kind of, through our example so far, looked at how we build up and how that unification happens in Q. So we don't really need to spend too much time there. I guess it's important to point out that the order, the order is irrelevant. Um, you know, that from top to bottom in that Q file, it doesn't matter what comes first. You could have hundreds, thousands of lines of data, apply all your constraints to the bottom, apply all your constraints to a different file, you can merge together a hundred files. The order makes no difference because Q is going to load all of the values, unify them on top of each other, and then apply the constraints. Uh, and on occasion, apply the constraints as you go. But uh, so order really means nothing in Q, which uh, is one of those difficult things to wrap your head around at first because it feels natural that ordering would matter, but it, it really doesn't matter at all. Okay, true and incomplete, yeah. So that's just because, 
you know, we do have conditionals here. So uh, let's see. Let's do name David. And then we can do an name David age 31. And then if we modify this to be David 2, we shouldn't see the age come out. So the fact that it's not Turing complete is actually a good thing. And the fact that we have the ability to drop in some language constructs like if, uh, if conditionals, and we even have access to, to for ends, etc. Um, they're not there to give you a fully qualified programming language, right? We're, we're working with data and constraints. We don't need to be true and complete. So it's important to take that away as well. All right. Wow. We're 35 minutes in and we haven't covered all the types, but let's do that now. So it's basically what you would expect and probably what you work with on a daily basis. You know, we have this ability to represent null. We have booleans, we have strings, we have bytes, we have numbers, we have integers. This is object or map syntax, and this is lists. Something you'll see in error messages more than your own code is the concept of a top and bottom. These have got mathematical things behind them that I will not try to articulate, but you can use uh, an underscore as a top value. And this just means that it's at the top of the, the type list, the tree, uh, and everything below it will match and be successful. This represents bottom. This means no match whatsoever. So you'll see that and you won't really type that too much in your own queue, but you will see it in the error messages and it will throw you the first time. Hopefully now by having a quick look at it, you now go, oh, okay. Um, so you can use this as a wild card. Uh, and if you need something to never exist, then a bottom may be your best bet. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we can skip this and we don't need to talk about null question. We've got numbers. Yeah, we have the ability to represent any number with the number type, integers with the integer types. We can use uh, floats, and I think that's maybe it. Uh, yeah, in fact, we've got a few other different types here too. There you go. <laughs> Octals, binaries, hex, CPUs, mems. Okay, I actually had no idea all of those were built in. That's pretty cool. Um, but I guess a lot of these would make working with Kubernetes uh, a bit nicer. Strings, we've already kind of looked at. Uh, we do have multi-line strings. I'm not sure what language the three things come from. I think it's, I know Elixir does it, maybe a few others. Uh, you can use escaping, and then we've got a few escape sequences, and then raw strings like Rust and a few other languages as well. Uh, let's get to some more fun stuff. We've covered structs, we've covered definitions. Boating, 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 boating. Okay, cool. The queue also exposes some expressions. So we'll take a look at some of these expressions just so we cover a little bit of the base cases. And then I think it'll be fun if we take a look at the standard library and then uh, cautious of time, but we'll jump over and look at some Kubernetes imports and how you can use queue in a Kubernetes context. So yeah, just one question before that. Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, this one is from Porco again. And are there any use cases for this outside of the app configuration templates? Uh, can you use this to validate data as in check if data JSON files have valid schema or data values? Or is that not a good case? No, that's a perfect use case. Um, and I think we, we, did, we did take a look at that. But you know, if we pop this open again and say, look, there's main.json. And as main.yaml, you know, we can validate both of these files against our queue schema. Now our queue schema has um, changed a little. <laughs> so we'll just uh, do string age. Let's just accept numbers now. Uh, so you can just vet all of that together and that'll work. And if I modify our main.json uh, and we'll say age 23 or 22, uh, we now get a validation. So Borgo, you're saying, can you use this to validate data? 100% yes. Um, and if you have multiple schemas of data across different file, uh, different directories, in fact, maybe I'll just show you a use case from my own repository. Um, I think that might be a little bit easier. Um, so I have this uh, for my blog, work in progress, but 
we have some schemas here and uh, I have a category where I'm saying a category is a data set that has a, a name and you can ignore this. We haven't covered this yet. This is a, an annotation in Q where I can say in template, this is science fiction, which just allows me to do some cool stuff with the QCLI. We have optional types. We actually haven't covered that yet, but the question mark on the name or the key means that this is optional. Uh, and then I have a profile. We pretty much built something very similar here. I have, except this is a bit more um, feature complete and that I have, this is what, uh, in fact, this is cool. I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we have here is that a profile has a bunch of properties, forename and surname, which are strings, age, which is an integer. Um, maybe they work for a company, maybe they have a job title, maybe you've got a whole bunch of markdowns stored as body, and maybe you've got social accounts. And what is a social account? Well, it is a, a list of indeterminate size where the, the members of the list could be a Twitter account, a GitHub account, or just a miscellaneous account. Okay, so what are those? Well, a Twitter account We've got a hard-coded value is that the network is Twitter. So we're using this as an identifier for further computation in the, the Q document. But all Twitter accounts must have a username. All Twitter accounts have a handle. Not only that, we can do generation within the types. So here, what we're saying is, well, the URL for a Twitter account, we know what that is. It is Twitter.com. And then we do a reference to the document itself and pull in the username. And we also validate that it must be a string. Uh, this is kind of pointless here, but because we, we pull through the username from here, but if someone tried to provide a URL that was a number, it would cause the validation to fail. If we do the same for GitHub, only this time we're saying the URL can be generated and it is a combination of github.com and the username. And then for cases where we don't know the Twitter account or we want to be able to allow them to add their own accounts, maybe it's for Polywork or MySpace or TikTok, whatever. You can just drop in the URL and the network yourself and it will just work. And then I can have websites where I publish content to. And we can have any file we want. Does it could be YAML, it could be JSON, it could be Markdown. And these directories, there's profiles here. We have this view in raw. You can see here I'm using Markdown where we validate the YAML front matter and we make an inference that the body is the body. Um, this is something QBlocks does for you, so it's a cool project to check out. Um, but yes, would be the answer. So store your data wherever you want, have the directories, have schemas, and then tie it all together. That was a very long-winded answer there, Borco, but I hope it helped. <laughs> all right. Uh, Carlos is telling me just to jump to Kubernetes. Come on, Carlos, we've got a journey, a story to tell here. Uh, so yeah. Joshua. One the, yeah, one of the interesting uh, things, like I'm thinking of use case of converting between config for different use cases, lots of different service providers out there with annoyingly similar, but different config options. Yeah, um, that is, <laughs> Siam, who is on Polywork. Okay, sorry, I was reading the chat. Uh, yeah, that's something really cool you can do with Q as well. Now, I'm not going to be, able, because of time, I'm not going to be able to do anything particularly convoluted here, but it's a very um, valid question there, Joshua. So let's assume that we have an abstraction on a person, right? Uh, and I'm going to assume everybody has Twitter. So we have, uh, do, do, do. Let's see if I can get this right, person. So I've got a definition. This is our abstraction where we are defining what a person is. And then we've got people, which is a list of person. Like so, uh, spell people. And then we define our data. So uh, let's see, name. I feel like I'm just typing the same data on a loop now, but let's get there. What age do I want to be now, 35? Okay, now this would be valid Q. And we get our people out. However, you may want to convert that to a different format. And you can do that in Q2. So uh, I'm going to have to look up the list comprehension syntax, I think. But let's assume that CloudFormation uh, expects data to be for person 
in people uh, it only wants name. Oh, I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Ah, damn it. Uh, oh, I don't need the backslash here because I'm not on a string. I don't even need the quote, the brackets. Uh, no, I do because it's... Ah, uh, hold on. We'll work this out. Yeah, let's look it up. So there's less comprehensions. <laughs> uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go. Let's copy one of these. Uh, so what did I get wrong? List for... Yeah, that was close. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was almost there. Okay. Let's take that out. And then... Cool. I wasn't far off. I just forgot the square brackets. Okay. So CloudFormation only expects our people to have a name and doesn't expect anything else. Then something you can do with the QCLI is apply further expressions and convert the data so that we only get CloudFormation back out. So that's one of the other really cool things about Q is that we can build these abstractions where we say, okay, we have this generic data type of a person. We are going to store all of them in a list of people. And then we define the data for the people. But when we work with CloudFormation, well, we want to iterate over the people we have here, but output something slightly different. And we could also say, well, we also now want their age. So person.age. And we get our CloudFormation template on the other side. So you can build in all of these different versions of your data. We could have another one in here. And I know this is contrived, but you know, say you wanted to generate uh, TypeScript types. You know, you could also do the same here with an iterator or a comprehension and then spit out the data that that expects. So yes, the um, Harsh in the chat is saying that the comprehensions look Pythonic. You're right, they definitely do look like Python list comprehensions. They're familiar there which is probably why I couldn't remember the syntax exactly. But uh, back to Joshua's question, yes, you can abstract data that you're going to use for multiple purposes and then build generic functions that spit out the data in the format that you need for each individual use case. And I, hopefully I was able to show that off a little bit there, but that was uh, thrown together quickly. <laughs> uh, Wyan asked a question too, uh, are there any tools to provide autocomplete while writing Q? Uh, funny that you mentioned that. Um, so the answer is no. However, Brian and I are working on a VS Code plugin uh, with a, a language server implementation for Q blocks that may or may not work with Q. So um, time dependent, we'll hopefully get something out soon. Um, I'll be sure to drop a message in the, the chat. I'll come back to the video at a later date. All right. Awesome. We have... 12 minutes left. So let's do something with some Kubernetes documents then, right? Absolutely. Got to keep Carlos happy. So yep. <laughs> uh, let's go to my clustered repository uh, where I have some documents. Uh, is that going to be the best bet? Yeah, probably. Okay, so here I've got uh, my Q deployment. I've got a Postgres here. Um, you can see this is pretty standard YAML for Kubernetes. So we can do an import uh, deployment, oh, Q, import deployment. And you'll see here, um, so this has imported our YAML as a Q definition. But this doesn't get you anything of value up front. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> this does this doesn't change anything right this this doesn't modify your yaml you've still got a lot of replication here um but one of the things that we can do is start to leverage q um to make this easier so let's see what could we do here so here we have our selector match labels app so we could say well uh, underscore is a private field in Q. This means when I run Q eval, it will be ignored. But we can say our labels are and app clustered. 
and we can come down here and we can actually remove this and do labels. So we can then delete here, labels. Do we have any more? No, okay, it's just the two. Uh, what else could we do? Um, well, actually, let's evaluate this first. So we can do a qeval deployment.q and we should see, yeah, our labels have been uh, fit back in. All right. So you can also do, uh, this is where I'm going to get the syntax wrong as well. Let's try container, which takes a name string. And this is a object which has a name container. In fact, no, we should use name, which has an image of name and an image pool. So what I'm trying to do here is standardize what we expect a container to look like in a Kubernetes context. You know, we may just say that actually everybody should have a liveness probe. A liveness probe should be HTTP get. So we're just removing all of this boilerplate. And we expect every application to expose health and port 8080. And I'm not going to do it all. Hopefully this just kind of gives us enough. But we can come down to here. Oh yeah, resource limits is probably a good one. But we can we can add that later, right? So let's get this working first. So we have containers, uh, which is hold on, I get my spaces all working. Uh, container. Blah. Let's see. I'm sure I'm going to mess this up, but let's. Nope. Nine five. What did I get wrong? Maybe that. Well, I need an adult. No. Uh, okay, let's take a look at the docs. Do, do, do. Give me. Do, do, do. In fact, I will fix that Kubernetes in a minute, but we didn't even touch on the standard library. So, the other thing you should take away from today is that uh, Q provides access to all of these um, modules. Most of them are just uh, the, the Go modules, but exposed to Q. So, you do have the ability to import time and do time validations. Um, you can access text template if you want to start doing some really weird stuff. Um, strings, there's regex, there's path and networks and stuff. All of this is available to you. And you can just use import like you would in Go. In fact, it, it just looks like Go. And you can call these functions straight up, right? So that's really, really powerful. But I want to fix my Kubernetes example and I do need the docs. So let's see if we can get uh, something from here. So the Q documentation, they have tutorials on the GitHub repository. And I'm just going to look for what I think I need. Oh, there's one there. Uh, I think this was then equals. And that might be it. No. Oh, yeah, because now I've taken out my... Thing. Oh, come on. I should really read the error messages, shouldn't I? Okay, cannot have both an alias and a field. Oh, yeah. Dope. So that was just me being. Uh, let's use what they actually use. So the problem there was I had a field called name here which was then referencing the field name, which I was passing through. So I'll explain this code in a second if I ever get it to work in time, but I'm hoping we will get there. <laughs> All right, and I'm calling it wrong. So where do they call service? Ah. Damn you computers. OK, 
Okay, I don't see it. I'm gonna have to remember this myself. So what should be happening here is that we've defined this type here. And this is a map. So we're saying this is a list with a, an identifier key, which I should be able to pass in and it should stub all of this for me. But I'm actually calling it wrong here. And I'm trying to remember why. Phew. There we go. Pressure lifted, except it didn't work. <laughs> That's not right. Ah, so annoyed at myself. So, why is it not working? Container. Stress, 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 stress. Uh, da, 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 da. Hold on. If I, if I don't get it, yeah, right, forget it. It'll come to me five minutes after your stream. Sorry, but that's Diane. And someone in the chat tells me I might be missing something. But what we're doing here is we define something called a container, which actually takes a key of ID, and then we can stub out all of these properties automatically. And then I should be able to just down here say that this is a container. Um, with the key ID, which in this case would be Nginx, which should stub out the name and the image for me. And I'm just doing something really, really silly and it's not coming to me yet. Uh, no, uh, I'm not sure, but it should have worked. Damn it. It's fine. I know uh, it'll, come, it'll come just uh, when we put, uh, hit that end broadcast button, it'll, uh, you know, it uh, automatically, it automatically come. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions in the chat? I'm happy to take them and I'll quickly skim this to see what I got wrong. No questions, but um, uh, what I see from the comments, obviously, and my opinion as well, like uh, this looks pretty interesting and solid and powerful uh, with respect to what all uh, schemas that you can create, constraints that you can create, and you can validate stuff uh, and you can, uh, you know, have uh, multiple files uh, and do that. There is a disjunction. Uh, that we talked about um uh and there is also like the kubernetes one uh you're showing uh we can do with that as well so a lot of things that we can do obviously it's not a full-fledged programming language uh and it it was not meant to be but it is catering a lot of other use cases uh also uh, harsh pointed out to a repository of cube vela i think this is also using uh cube uh, so it, it's uh, good that we are seeing, I mean, uh, you can see the powerful uh, power that the cloud native industry in various projects are trying to uh, implement Q. So I think that's this is the right time uh, to, you know, uh, get your hands dirty with Q and contribute to some of these projects, especially the one that is uh, uh, there, which is, uh, you know, getting done by the Solomon Hikes and team. Um, I think there was a stream on Dagger uh, that that uh, Solomon has already done on on Raw Code Academy, so you can uh, you know just have a glimpse and see that like what Dagger actually does uh, and how you can uh, you know deploy the applications easily uh, to your uh, clusters uh, using Dagger. Uh, I have used it uh, as well, so that's that's pretty much. Uh, and also, I mean, people are saying everything is interesting, and yeah, looks interesting. <laughs> You know, I just remembered there is, uh, so I, I have the queue um, repository clone for a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, they do have something in here with some queue files. And if we jump into, okay. yeah, they do something similar here. Hmm. Um, so I would encourage people, if you want to see that last bit actually work, uh, the Qlang repository doc tutorial Kubernetes manual services. There's a whole bunch of Q in there where they are actually manipulating Kubernetes uh, objects and spitting them back out. That would probably be the best reference. Um, but I hope what I've shown you has kind of sparked a little bit of interest in Q. It's a really powerful tool with a lot of features, constraints on how you get started, templating is where you start moving forward to. Uh, it's a great tool. Absolutely. And uh, uh, David, you did just 
you know a flawless uh, job in, in explaining in q like it was a, a pro level uh, you know uh, things that you have done so i think uh, that was really a good flow to be very honest and i think everybody in the chat would agree uh, on starting from you know uh, very small things and uh, to do some of the uh, complex things as well so looks like you know a powerful language easy to understand easy to adapt uh, so it has you know, more powers to it and less of the learning curve uh, usually, in, whenever there's a technology related to Kubernetes, there's more of a learning curve, but uh, it has uh, less of a learning curve and uh, more of the contribution opportunities out there. So I think uh, this is the again would, re would repeat the same thing. Like this is the right time to you know get your head sturdy and keep contributing in some of the things that Rockcode is doing and uh, Solomon is doing or Cube Vela and some of the other projects that are doing them. Cool. Uh, so yeah, thanks, David, for again spending time uh, with me and uh, uh, teaching us Q. It was really interesting, and I hope uh, we uh, we all learned uh, Q pretty fast. Uh, contribute to your projects and some of the other projects that are there out there uh, in the cloud native ecosystem. And thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we will be uh, continuing the streams, obviously. Uh, Saturday, Sundays are off. Uh, just relax a bit. And then we'll be back on Monday uh, with the next set of streams. Um, anything else you want to add, David? Well, I don't have to fix my code now. But no, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. And uh, uh, thank you for having me. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, I've had a lot of fun this week doing Rust and doing Q, so thank you for, for having me on, and I, I hope your audience like it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do not forget to subscribe both the channels, uh, Rock or Academy, and my channel where you're watching this, uh, so that you know we can get you more and more content out there. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll leave you for the rest of your weekends. Uh, have a nice day. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye, all.